Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as the One Inch Wonder, and I have a bit of a different style video today. Normally, videos on this channel cover different speedruns where I provide commentary over the speedrun as it's happening, and you all like to leave lots of comments marveling at how insane some of the glitches are. There's seemingly an equal amount though, joking about how insane it is that these glitches were found in the first place, and asking how on earth people even discovered them. My friend Easyscape already has some videos covering times that speedrun skips were accidentally discovered, but today we're going to go a bit more in depth. I contacted three members of the speedrunning community who have found glitches that are used in speedruns, and interviewed them about the game they speedrun, the glitch they found, and got to hear their stories and insight on discovering these glitches. And that's what this video is, three first-hand accounts on how speedrun glitches have been found. I hope that this video gives you a bit of insight into how speedrunners search for ways to break games, and in part answers the question of how speedrun glitches are found. If you enjoyed the video, then subscribe for more videos like this in the future, and leave a comment with more things you'd like to hear about firsthand from runners and people who have found glitches. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see you there. I Chicago guy was just admiring Pietro da Cortona's allegory of divine providence and Barberini power since I'm a huge fan of frescoes. In fact, I spend so much time admiring the work of Pietro and other pieces like Raphael's Disputation of the Holy Sacrament, I barely have time to play games anymore. Thankfully, that can all be changed thanks to today's sponsor, AFK Arena. AFK Arena is a non-grindy RPG that doesn't require a ton of time investment and is easy to get into. It's easy to play casually without too much effort or strategizing, but the depth is still there if you want to implement smart lineups or unit combinations. One might say it's the best RPG for a busy you. This means I can spend all my AFK time when I'm admiring these frescoes, also leveling up and collecting in-game. I'm getting word that our live on the scene correspondent, Minnesota Guy, is standing by with some breaking news. Minnesota Guy? Yeah, sure thanks, Chicago Guy. Turns out that AFK Arena, while having a western fantasy background, also has a fresco art style, don't you know? Back to you, Chicago Guy. Wow, well you heard it here first, folks. I could now spend my AFK time both admiring the fresco art style of the game, in addition to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Seize the opportunity to play as Zafrael and Lucretia, two new free heroes that are celestial and hypogean elite heroes. You can help support Tomato Anus' channel and keep me and Minnesota Guy employed by downloading AFK Arena with the link in the description. And use the bonus code there as well to get yourself some rewards. Hey, my name is Nolan. I go by Nolan Runs, and I found the glitch early lens for Link's Awakening Switch. I started speedrunning Link's Awakening Switch on launch day. I just loved LADX so much back in the day. Um, I just wanted to be ground floor on the new one, and I became active in the Discord and started looking for ways to route the game, break the game, and then following the progress and development. It was pretty insane. The game was a very rapidly developed game. In just one month, we discovered a lot of tricks, a lot of tech that uh, brought the time down drastically. If you've never seen this game, it's a top-down Zelda. You have your dungeons, eight of them in this case, and this game's very strange compared to a lot of other Zelda games because the premise is you're trying to wake up from this trippy dream where a giant fish is God. It's uh, honestly one of the strangest pieces of lore in the series. So with the remake, the speedrun requires you to get all eight instruments from the dungeons in order to open the egg and defeat this nightmare in your dream to wake up. So to describe the speedrun, it's very hybrid based. And by that, I mean you're doing a lot of sequence breaks, a lot of technical tricks and glitches, but at the same time, you're still having to complete all eight dungeons, which means getting the instrument from that dungeon. In some cases, that means completing the dungeon almost vanilla. In other cases, it means just skipping to that final instrument room and not even having to destroy the boss of that dungeon. At the discovery of Early Lens, it was used in any percent, and currently it's only used in the 100% category. So the state of the route before the glitch was discovered was what I would describe as very vanilla. 
you have to get all items from a trade sequence. So the classic Zelda trade sequence, right? So normally you would have to go through the entire trade sequence, a lot of talking, a lot of backtracking in order to get the mermaid skill, which is the item that allows you to move the mermaid statue, revealing the magnifying lens cave. So the magnifying lens item is used to, well, it's required to read the dark secrets of Koholan Island, which is this book in May Village Library that reveals the maze pattern in the final dungeon of the game, which is called the Windfish Egg. So it's just dark and you don't know which way to go, left, right, up, or down. And that is randomized every file. So every time you create a new file, that pattern will be random, but this book will tell you what to do. So it was required to read that book, and in order to read it, you need the magnifying lens. Early Lens was found five days after launch on September 25th. Pretty proud of that, honestly. <laughs> Early Lens allows you to enter the staircase that leads to the magnifying lens without moving the statue, which means you don't have to complete the trade sequence in order to get to that cave. So normally you're talking, like I said, you're backtracking and you're trying to get all of the items to get to the scale, but Early Lens skips all that and allows you to just clip inside of that mermaid statue to get the lens before you're supposed to. So the way this glitch works is you need to get on the outer wall around the mermaid statue. So this is just putting Link out of bounds and then going back in bounds into the statue, which will push Link into the staircase that is underneath the statue instead of having to move it. And the game thinks that Link has touched the staircase, which does exist before moving the statue. So the way Early Lens works is combining one fundamental glitch that is used heavily throughout the route, and this glitch is called air climbing. Now, funny enough, this glitch was discovered the day before I discovered Early Lens, and it was discovered by Flockger, we just call him Flock, and it has become the glitch in Link's Awakening Switch. So you first need to air climb on the ladder near the statue in Martha's Bay. And the way you do this is you stand at the top of the ladder. It looks like Link is standing on air. You pick up the blue rooster, which is this lovable character in the game. And then you move forward and the game thinks that Link is on the ladder, but you begin to climb on an invisible ladder, seemingly on air. So that's why we call it air climbing. At the peak of that ladder or fake ladder, you jump off and fly over the trees to get on the wall, which makes Link out of bounds. Now, once you're out of bounds, you have to do a tightrope walk all the way around to the statue. And in my opinion, this is the more challenging part of the trick just because of the stress level and the stress factor in a run. And you're having to just make sure that you stay right in the center of that fence. Otherwise, you're going to fall off back into bounds in the water or on the land and it's going to be slow. So you have to walk all the way around. Once you get to the corner, you can jump or walk back into bounds and Link is pushed into the same space that the mermaid statue is occupying and Link hits the staircase trigger and regardless of where the statue is, he goes into the, the stairs and into the cave. The fence tightrope walk is, is not very forgiving. It's very dependent on Link being right on top and it's a sliver, it's, it's a wall. It's an invisible wall, right? And so Link is actually inside of that wall. Looks like he's walking on a fence, but there's a very tall wall right there. And so you don't want to go too far left or right, or it's gonna push you out immediately and you have to retry the trick. If you mess up the tightrope, I would say you're looking at a close to a one minute time loss, maybe more, because you have to walk all the way back around. Well, first you have to swim around, walk all the way back around and then set up the trick again. So it can, it's, it's pretty devastating in a run. If I had to rate the difficulty of this trick, let's say out of 10, with 10 being very difficult, I'd say about a six. It requires an understanding of a fundamental glitch, which in our case is air climbing. So you have to be able to set that up efficiently and actually perform it. But the hard part is actually the precise movement, especially under pressure.
I discovered early lens because I was I was looking for <laughs> early lens. Like it was my mission to make that happen. Now again, we're five days into the game's life. We just got the game and the community is looking for things. It's fresh, you know how new games are. Everyone wants to, to discover something. And you know, at the time, the vanilla aspect of the game was the trade sequence. And so this theory that the community came up with was like, man, it would be great to get the lens early. And so I thought, well, sure it would. So I'm just going to spend the rest of my life doing it until I get it. Like I'm I'm doing it on my lunch break. I'm putting off work because that's the beauty of speed running on the switch. You know, on the train, I'm practicing tech at work, taking breaks, and I'm trying to get into this statue. So at one point, you can see on my Twitter feed, at one point I'm like stuck in the ground trying to fly into the staircase. I'm trying to kill Link to get back into bounds so that maybe I fall into the staircase. So I was looking for this trick. It was my life's mission and I, I, I found it. And and, you know, tweeted it, clip goes viral. Uh, I think ZFG uh, retweeted it and I had to turn off notifications. But what was great about that is that I think it gave the game some traction. I feel many people may have wrote the game off as, eh, it's a remake, it's not as good as LEDX, it's not really gonna be a good speed game. And it was a it was a big moment. Uh, it was it was great. We, we had fun with that one. So yeah, I was, I, I was really looking for that one. My first instinct to try and get into that statue and the stupid staircase was to go out of bounds. And before air climbing, there was a method of getting out of bounds with bombs, actually. You can you can bomb clip through some floors or the ground in some areas of the game with ladders, right? And there's water underneath the statue, so you can swim. So I was swimming under, under the ground close to the statue, but there's like an entire void space that Grezzo placed around the staircase, if not all staircases out of bounds. I don't know as a, as a safety measure for this very thing. So you can actually void in an infinite state. And so that was happening constantly, resetting the console, bomb clipping again. So that was my first line of thinking was like, I'm just gonna clip into the ground and then swim over there and somehow not fall into this bottomless pit, but it didn't work out. So early lens saved about three to five minutes, and that's kind of a big window there. That's my best estimate because it wasn't used for a long time. However, Samurai Man was actually the one that was really pushing the record at the time. <laughs> the first week of, of the release, and it saved at least three minutes, more like four plus. So it, it saved minutes. It was, a, it was a pretty good find. If I hadn't have found Early Lens, the state of the run would actually be the same as it is today. It's actually, a, it's kind of ironic. Uh, <laughs> this is terrible. The day after I discovered Early Lens, the remake programming community in the LAS Discord discovered RNG manipulation. So what that meant was that we don't actually have to read the book to uncover the path because it can be predicted every time because the way the game is coded, the RNG is set at game start. So if you reset your switch and start your game at the same time, every time, uh, your egg path is gonna be the same every time. So you don't even have to read the book. And I'm, you know, I'm just a little salty, but you know, 100% still uses it. So my pride isn't completely destroyed, but I'm talking day after so it, it was a short-lived glitch but it lives on in hundo <laughs> i was so pissed but i was happy it saved so much time rng manip it was good while it was only used for a couple runs <laughs> technically and while it's not being used in any percent it meant a lot for the community again we're looking at the first week Five days into the lifespan of the game, it was the first quote unquote breakthrough glitch that set the stage for further glitch hunting, further research, further progression of the game. And it just felt great, right? And it, it was, it, it meant a lot because at the time we thought the game was extremely unbreakable vanilla as you do with new games. So it was huge, right? And it was, it was fun to freak out for that for a little bit. And it also proved that stairs can exist before an event. So that could mean a lot of things for future glitches. Getting the rooster early, for instance, that's like the next pipe dream. It saved time. So I'm very happy with the glitch and I, I'm happy that I found it. Hey everyone, it's Shift here and I'm gonna explain how sponge warping works in Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. 
I'm mostly known for speedrunning the original game, which I've been doing for the past four or so years, but for a little bit, when the remake of this game came out this summer, I speedran it for a couple weeks, and before the game was even released, actually, I had a review copy. So, Battle for Bikini Bottom is a 6th gen platformer, which also has adventure game aspects and some puzzling as well. You pretty much work your way through these levels that were inspired by the show to collect golden spatulas which are used to unlock the final boss, and once you beat the final boss, you beat the game. Rehydrated is a remake. It's not the original game repainted or recoded. It's a game built from the ground up on Unreal Engine, whereas the original game was built on Renderware 17 years ago. So it's entirely different, and therefore when you see something like the Bubble Bowl, the Cruise Bubble, the Bubble Bounce, and so forth, they're all meant to emulate the original game's moves, but they're not the exact same thing functionally. So as it's well known, Battle for Bikini Bottom is one of the more broken platformers in speedrunning, but the thing is, it's broken in a way that, you know, when you put a game under enough pressure for a long enough time, you eventually find cracks and exploits to, you know, make use of, and they lead to more exploits, and eventually you just have a game that's extremely broken because the community spent so much time breaking it. But it seemed like Rehydrated, just putting a little bit of thumb pressure on it just made it completely collapse. I mean, the game had a warp to the end of the game, day one. Immediately, even after that, people were still finding tons of insane glitches because the game is just so busted. Rehydrated is basically three-fourths glitches and one-fourth movement, and BFEB is the exact opposite, where it's like three-fourths movement, one-fourth glitches and tricks and stuff. Now, in Rehydrated, um, there was a glitch found the literal first day the game came out that can be used to warp to the end of the game because the devs uh, oversaw something in Unreal Engine that allows you to use two controllers at the same time to warp to different parts of the menu you haven't unlocked yet. So, due to this, you can beat the game with two spatulas instead of the usually required 77. So, like how Mario 64, you need 70 to get to the final area. It's like that, but in this game, you need 77. So because of this, we created a new category called 77 spatulas, and in this, as the name implies, you finish the game with 77 spatulas, having not used the warp glitch to go straight to the end of the game. But there's also a third category, 100%, so we have two, 77, and 100. The sponge warping glitch is used in 77 and 100 because you actually get to go in other places than just the pineapple and the final boss, so there's more of a use of those things because you can damage boost in them. I was doing some glitch hunting before the game actually came out, and I was able to show people what I'd found finally when the embargo lifted the day before the game came out. And uh, yeah, that's because I was one of the people who got a review copy from THQ Nordic, so I was doing some glitch hunting while I was anticipating being able to show people the game. One of these things that I showed off in this video that I released was the sponge warp. I actually don't have an exact day when I found it, because I found it during the period when I had my review copy and the embargo wasn't lifted and then I uploaded it on the day the embargo was lifted, the day before the game came out. So it was like sometime within a week before the game came out, <laughs> I found the glitch. Sponge warping was implemented within the first week of the game coming out. The name Sponge Warp is a play on the name of the glitch from the original game called Sponge Gliding, which is the one where you float across the beach. Many of you are probably familiar with that one. But Sponge Warping is entirely different, where it's based on damage boosting and slamming while you're being launched back. Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated's physics engine is not traditional by any means. It feels very stiff and scripted, but to our advantage actually in speedrunning. Damage boosting kind of just sends you back like a bungee cord to where you were standing before, and using the bubble bounce hard translates you upward. So if you combine the weird scripted physics of the damage boosting with the translation upward from the bubble bounce, you get this weird effect where the game calculates your landing position somewhere else than you should have been. So you can use this to warp around maps and land on taller objects and farther objects than you would have been able to before. So in a blink of an eye you're watching this happen and you just instantly teleport from one area to the next. It's pretty crazy. Because the physics engine just feels so last thought, many of the actions in the game feel scripted where it's, it just hard calculates where it's going to put you and just kind of like animates you back to that spot instead of actually having real physics. So if it's just calculating some translation from being damage boosted back and it's taking another translation at the same time into consideration while you're being translated already, it kind of makes sense you would end up in some weird spot that just doesn't feel appropriate to where you jump from. Because the base game mechanic is trying to place you back to where you were if you touch something that hurts you and knocks you back, but interrupting it with another calculation would in theory cause you to move somewhere else. So that's kind of the idea is that you get put somewhere where you shouldn't be because the game is calculating something based off of two different actions you just did. 
It eventually got found out that you can use a lag to extend these, so now most of the run is using these sponge warping lag tricks to kind of boost around the map and just warp anywhere, just going straight into the sky and launching down. So in the original game, one of the most useful tricks in the history of the game's existence is the one frame damage boosting where between your damage animation and your falling animation, you have one frame where you can do any grounded move. And obviously we wouldn't expect that to work in the remake because it's different, but we still wanted to see how we could use damage boosting and combining moves to our advantage. So before I was able to show people stuff during the embargo period, I wanted to try to find a way to damage boost on top of one of the statues in the Kelp Caves to get to one of the crystals early. So I ended up sitting and testing, bouncing off the goo, and then slamming immediately after bouncing, and just seeing what would happen. And eventually, after doing it a bunch of times, I just got shot straight up, and I hit the ceiling, and I fell straight down, and landed on the statue. It just felt completely random. I popped off really hard, but nobody could hear it, because I was obviously not allowed to stream it. But it was really strange and cool, and I wanted to investigate to see where else it could be used. So I tried it in Goo Lagoon as well, where I got another really big boost, and I showed this off in my pre-release glitches and tricks video, actually, the first two tricks to be shown. So I couldn't get on top of the castle with that one, but then I thought to myself, well, because the level design is different, maybe this can be used to, like, maybe clip out of the Gulagoon Caves. So if you check the video as well, I theorized the possibility of shooting out of the upper, like, little hole in the cave, like, in the ceiling. Obviously, like, these, these are all, like, pre-release theory crafting and glitches, so they're pretty dated now. But just to kind of get you in the state of mind that somebody would be in when they're trying to glitch hunt a brand new game, that's pretty much what I was thinking when I was going through. I personally didn't find the useful implementations that are being done in runs now, but it seemed like pretty much immediately people were finding uses for them but they still felt random. But now it seems like they're being used in a lot of spots and runs and also being used with implementation of lag as well. So it seems that the people who are still actively running the game have gotten them down quite a bit and they've kind of put it down to a science. It's cool to see how stuff feels almost random or just unexplained when a game first comes out or when a glitch is first found. And over time, they just get better to the point where most people are using them in runs. It seems though that most of just the top players have a grasp on how sponge warping and lag boosting work, but a lot of the lower level players have kind of difficulty getting into the run because they feel they might have to learn those to get competitive times. According to Jay, which is one of the top runners of the game, he's third place I believe. He says they're consistent but just difficult. I would take his word for it, but I can't speak for myself. If you mess up a sponge warp, the amount of time you lose from doing it depends on whether you die and if you die from doing it, where you respawn. So for example, when I was running on high FPS, the, the sponge warp to do Goo Lagoon skip would place you all the way back by Mrs. Puff by the muscle bar if you failed it, so you have to go all the way back over there to try it again. So it depends on where you're doing it and how risky it is. And I've seen some of the runners do the ones in like Dutchman's Graveyard where if you fail it, you get launched so high in the air, you could probably just die or fall in some random spot if you mess it up. So it seems pretty high risk, high reward. I'm sure now, if according to the runners, it's consistent but difficult, I'm sure it probably feels pretty satisfying to get them, especially because there are so many of them. It's used many times with the lag now. Getting all of them in a single run might just be the best feeling ever to actually perform them all perfectly. I believe that sponge warping in conjunction with the lag strategies made it much more challenging, I agree, yeah. Because the lag strategies really blew it wide open, because sponge warping is just a method of damage boosting, and the lag strats just amplify the damage boosting to make them much more powerful. I don't remember exactly who found the lag strategies, but I remember that back during the first week the game was out, a runner named Four, who's been around the community for, well, I believe he joined in 2014, and he left at some point in 2015 and came back in 2018, so he's been, like, in and out. He contributed to the development of lag strategies, which originally started with window dragging, which people really weren't happy about, and some people thought it was, like, metagaming, where you're, like, doing something outside the game to affect it but it was found eventually that you can use steam mapping on your controller to create like different hotkeys for clicking and dragging the window. And it's not a macro either, be just before that comes up, it's not a macro because it's all one input for one input. So for example, you'd have one hotkey that maps to the mouse, which is positioned over the window. So you can use the window to lag the game without having to physically drag it. 
there's a whole explanation on how they use the mapping in Steam to make the strategy consistent and much less awful to perform. But that's basically the gist of it, is that people kind of developed like window dragging and like print screen lagging, and then eventually just got to the point where people were mapping their controllers to create like a little sequence that you can press buttons and generate lag. It's pretty cool. My personal philosophy is it's better knowing than not knowing because the goal is to make a game faster, not to make the game more fun. That's like the fun comes second, fast comes first. So I'm glad that we know this glitch exists, but I know there are people who feel that the development of lag strats in conjunction with sponge warping has made the game a lot more annoying to speed run. A lot of people stopped running it because of the lag strats. Despite knowing that a lot of people feel that lag boosting coming from sponge warping caused the game to become less fun to speedrun, I still think that it's cooler knowing these things exist than being blissfully unaware of them. You can choose to make rules around your game however you want, and obviously some games require more intervention than others. Like you see some games having different rules about like when to start their timer, like different timing methods and so forth. Some games have like rules about like you can do these glitches before you start the timer and so forth. Like different communities make their own rules on how to play their games competitively. But I feel that you should always just desire to know the most you can about a game and then just worry about the rules and the politics later. As soon as you start saying like, I wish this wasn't found, people are not gonna be motivated to look for stuff and you don't know what's not going to come from that, I suppose. It's best to encourage people to develop games and not be so focused on like, is this gonna be fun or not? Because you can worry about that later. There's always a chance to make your own rules and guide the community in the right direction that you best feel suits the purpose of the run and what the community stands for. Hello, I'm Hybrid, I'm a Norwegian speedrunner. I found Saddle Skedaddle in Oblivion. Mostly I find glitches in speed games, or I reroute speed games from the ground up. Usually those are awful games that I enjoy routing and showing off on marathons. Oblivion is a open world action RPG where you make your character and, uh, I don't know, you probably find stuff and do stuff to stuff, have fun, I assume, but uh, I'm all here for the, the glitches, I'm afraid, so I don't know what, much about the game other than that. The, the categories I have any interaction with was any percent and no dragon fire skip. But, but uh, yeah, Oblivion is a speed game. It's, uh, it's very broken. It has load warping, which uh, it's bringing your character from one point in space time to another point in space time. Uh, it has uh, duping, it has ways to stack your movement speed. It actually also has armor stacking. <laughs> Which I also was uh, instrumental in making viable, but it has uh, drinking a lot of drugs to go extra fast. Yeah, as a, as a speedrun, it's it's uh, it's very wonky. Let's let's put it that way. So load warping is a glitch in the mainline Bethesda games, not all of them, where you can make a save of your character and in some way or another teleport that character with its quest uh, information, its inventory, that kind of stuff, to another point. That point has to be a door or an entrance or some sort of load trigger that you have made a save at previously. So you can only travel from somewhere you've been to somewhere else you've been. The nice thing though is that you can be like inside of a dungeon let's say and you go all the way to the boss and usually you would have to run back through the dungeon again which would take time but we can just make a save and then load an old save by a door, open the door while loading the save inside of the dungeon. Our dungeon character comes out of the other side of the door traversing space time. I started messing around with Oblivion at some point before the 23rd of January but not many days before that so 21st January I would assume. And then I found Saddle Skedaddle on the 27th of January, so it took a week of on and off research. But um, yeah, it was uh, added to the any percent route on the day of discovery and then in the other categories the next day. <laughs> Saddle Skedaddle saves somewhere on the order of 21 seconds in any percent. People who are around speedrunning would be aware that uh, the shorter speedruns are by far more optimized. The time spent invested in them is less, so finding e even a second time save in 3 minutes is massive. So when you get upwards of 20 seconds, it's, uh, it's groundbreaking. Earth shattering is maybe a better word.
it also affects the other categories. In uh, No Out of Bounds or All Main Quests, it saves over a minute in one of the later sections of the game when you're in Paradise. You can use it to skip straight to uh, the ending of the of the area. The any percent uh, route before Saddle Skedaddle was. You're a prisoner man and then you run around in the sewers to get out of the sewers because when you're out of the sewers you go to the main city. And in the main city there's a district with a 1D door behind the door. If you interact with this door you're now in the end game area of the game. And obviously there's a trigger there that just gives you the last quest. And that's any percent. Right, so what, explaining what the glitch is, is very simple. If you sit in a saddle or a chair and make a save, and you load warp that save uh, within the same chunk of coordinates as the saddle or chair would be, then you get teleported to that location. How it works is way more complicated, and I'm not sure if anyone really understands why it's this way. So this, I'm gonna have to do this in steps. In Oblivion, you can have these informational panels up on the screen to show you like your position or the FPS the game is running at or the in-game date, stuff like that. And there's a bunch of pages of these and there's a lot of interesting information there. One of the lines is called a procedure pack. The best way to describe these procedure packages is if you were to sit in a chair, your character goes into this animation of sitting down in a chair. If it's a horse, your character goes into this animation of getting on a horse. So the first thing I discovered was that you can teleport with horses. Turns out you can do that over short distances in the same cell. Cell meaning uh, a chunk of the playable Bethesda games worlds. <laughs> you can do that with interacting with a chair or a horse. So you can teleport between short distances if you have a save and then interact with a horse or a chair and then load. So what if you bring a character that's on a chair or a horse into a door in the same cell? So what happens then is that you get a horrible mangled mess of a character model and then the game crashes. But you exist for like a sub sub substantial amount of time and that still makes no sense and we're not even, we're not even scratched the surface yet. Uh, what happened next was that I managed to make a horse-chair hybrid creature. So if you sit in a chair and make a save, and interact with a horse in the same cell, you are sitting on a chair on a horse. So th that just happens so to softlock the character, but nevertheless it's very interesting Yeah, as, as a witchcraft. <laughs> And the next step then was, well, we have this abomination, horrible hybrid creature. What, what if we load warp this now? Well, then we get sent to an alternate dimension. So if you've seen, like, how to do half an A-press in Mario, it's kind of the same deal. You get sent to an alternate, empty, unloaded universe if you are a load-warped horse-chair hybrid. And throughout all this load warping while sitting on chairs and on horses, I happen to realize that if you had coordinates that are the same in different cells, then this still works, this teleporting. So that's Saddle Skedaddle. It's having a procedure pack in one cell with certain coordinates and transferring it to another cell. And the coordinates have to be the same, because that's where the procedure pack tries to put you. And that's my understanding of Saddle Skedaddle. How that moves you doesn't quite make sense, but it is instantaneous teleportation, except for when you become a mangled abomination and then the game crashes. So instead of uh, clipping out of bounds immediately at the start of the end percent route, you first have to make a save at a chair, seeing as we have already, uh, to somewhat an extent, we understand Saddle Skedaddle now. So you need a save on a chair for it to work at all. So the first thing you do is you use the first chair available to you, which is the one in your cell. Which, uh, it's a very fortunate location, to be honest. So after having made a save in the chair, we then have to clip through the wall, and then we get to the door we need to saddle skedaddle on. To saddle skedaddle, you just press interact and escape at the same time, and then load the save with the chair in it. This will put you at the coordinates of the chair, which just so happens to be out of bounds in the next area. And then we can just go straight to where we want to go instead of having to deal with a collision. Saddle Skedaddle is also used later in the run, but right there it only saves uh, running through a cave. Or it saves running through a part of the cave. 
Saddle Skedaddle also changes other things with the run, but when we get through a few more doors and deal with the Emperor and stuff, we're gonna interact with a sewer grate that leads us to the sewer part of the prison escape sequence, the in intro of the game. And there we use the same Saddle Skedaddle save, which again saves quite a bit of time. Uh, when we use the Saddle Skedaddle the second time, we skip running through a corridor. Performing saddle skedaddle is not a hard thing to do, you just sit in a chair or on a horse and then you make a save. You just need some knowledge beforehand where to make the save. But if you have that, then there's no skill barrier <laughs> to perform the glitch. So, when I started looking for glitches in Oblivion, or in any game really, you kind of try to scope out what glitches are already known, or you use knowledge from the engine if you play other games like that, which I do. There tend to be overlap between games. It also helps uh, using the Bethesda game creation tools for modding. The scripts are the same, you know, written in the same scripting language and everything, so it's really easy to glitch hunt all these games at the same time. What I did when I started playing the game was I... Uh, what is that glitch even called? What, what is that called? It's like ragdoll slide or something. So I wanted to test that out and see what I could do with that. Obviously at that time I didn't know much about the any percent run or any of the categories really, or how applicable it would be, I'm just, you know, as a person very interested in looking for glitches. So I started looking into that and seeing how I could incorporate that into the little I knew of the route as it was. So when I was messing around with this uh, ragdoll sliding, I don't remember its exact name though, but when I was messing around with that, usually you tend to make saves that are have useful things nearby, like chairs or horses or maybe an NPC. In Oblivion it's very nice to have doors you can load warp to or from that are within the same cell. So I was sliding around because when you lose your stamina you store that location and then you can slide around with it if you load warp it. So one thing leads to another usually, like if you figure out that this sliding thing isn't really practical for the run, you still have a save where you have like a bunch of skooma potentially or some other things in your inventory or you use the console to do that at first and then you have a save that's ready to glitch hunt with. I have a save with a horse and a chair outside one of the major cities and uh, that's when I started looking into procedure packs because they're very similar to input enablers in Fallout 4 in that, in that version of the engine. That's when I started to like sit on horses while being chairs, uh, quick saving, quick loading, while doing both of them at the same time, stuff like that. And when I started load warping that, I, I saw that, you know, the game's starting to crash or stuff like that because it's trying to put me places that don't exist yet. And uh, that's how the procedure like fell together. You should never really disown a glitch. It's just something really cool you did or found to the benefit of others. Speedrunning is all about community, that's why we do the hobby. There's nothing intrinsically in interesting in speedrunning. It's the friends you make along the way, it's the communities you make. It's the, the shared love and interest for a game, for a system, how it works, right? Hey, it's me, I'm back. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing these few examples of how speedrun glitches were found. I originally had the idea for this video almost a year ago now, and it was super cathartic to finally make it, but I think the best part about making it was definitely getting to talk to Nolan, Shift, and Havard and getting to hear their stories. If you also enjoyed their stories, then please do check out their content, links to all their socials are in the description. Also, if you like this video as a whole, then please do subscribe and leave a comment because, believe it or not, subscriptions and comments are a quantitative way for me to gauge your interest in this type of video and whether or not I should make more in the future. Thank you for watching, but also huge thank you to everyone who has been supporting the channel on Patreon and who has had to deal with my cryptic allusions to wanting to make a video that isn't a speedrun explained in video update posts, which ultimately was me referring to making this video. All your support means the world, like, seriously, it is way too kind. If you want to support the channel monetarily, Patreon is 100% the best way to do that, but it's 100% not necessary for you to do, and I understand that money can be pretty tight right now. If you do decide to support the channel on Patreon though for as little as $1, you get access to videos a couple days early, get update posts on videos to hear about how they're coming along, and get a gauge for when they'll be out, and also get an occasional bonus video like Fanfiction Fridays. Patron or not though, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy, and I hope that you're achieving whatever goals you set for yourself, because no matter how small, it really can turn your day around to make a goal and achieve it.
This was a video detailing how several speedrun glitches were found. I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.